All right. Let me uh let me share out the uh the goodness here. Um so we're missing a, a, a few people today. We got uh we're down Leron and we're down Amy. Right. So um but uh still got chock full of uh goodness here. Andrew, you can call you can call Anthony Michelle for today. He's our yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> Oh man, I'm sure I'll I'll somehow mess that up for you, Anthony. But yeah. uh, appreciate you starting the recording. Um, all right, so uh, let's kick things off here, Jim, uh, and and see if you have personally any wins of the week you want to kick us off with. Uh, normally, uh, you got some always some uh, good stuff you want to share, but yeah, yeah, it's a short week. That's the problem. So we're down a day because of the holiday. Lots of good win. Yeah, I'll say this. You know, Sunday we kicked off managed fast alerts, and I know Ben and team, they're already catching stuff. Um, so that's, I think it's a win for us. It's a win for our MSPs and it's a win for their customers. Is there a, Ben, were there any commonalities you saw like where, you know, you're, you're the common user is, is, quote unquote, missing or coming up short in the configuration setup? Or is there a, any thematics you noticed or was it kind of across the board? Um, it was mostly the, the same kind of um, things that we usually use. Uh, mailbox sorting rules or a dead giveaway, uh, sign-ins from uh, strange VPNs and certain internet providers also uh, show up pretty frequently. Uh, I think... Uh, there's a big discussion on Discord of different ASM providers that we see that are usually okay with malicious activity. Got it. Guys, yeah, so it wasn't necessarily things weren't set up correctly. It's just more you guys are seeing the alerts of nefarious acts. Oh, is- yeah. I mean, we're, we're looking also at that, but you know, we're helping the, the MSP get make sure all their connections are in place so that they can get a full utilization of the software. We found that a lot of people... Uh, don't have this configured or that configured. So we're really helping them to kind of push them in that right direction. And once it is configured correctly, that's when we're able to really kick in and help them with um, the monitoring. That's awesome. Jim, uh, is there any, like seeing it's a short week, holiday week, are there any like two Ginsu knives if you do sign up still this week for Man and Sass Alert? <laughs> Ginsu knives. The, the, the promo is... Uh, better things for your customers so okay. that's no no ginsu no no ginsu okay andy you have something yeah it relates to the communication from the managed SAS to partners and that would be when you find something is it just an email that's coming over or given that you're using autotask can we set up comparable issues and subtype uh, sub issues to have a, a good correlation so we have a good workflow response uh, currently, right now, and it is Autotask, you're right. Uh, we set up the customer portal. We've set up uh, different response packages for people, as well as let them dictate how we um, they want to be contacted by us, if it's a phone call, if it's an email, or just a ticket. Um, but open to suggestions at this point, really. <laughs> I'm basically saying... If a full saying... of service now, it would be great, Shep. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Andy, for you, I was just going to say, by defining what you would consider the broad brushstrokes that you're going to send our way, then we can uh, set up corresponding repl- um, rules and notifications in our piece so it matches up easily. And I think that would be very mm-hmm. valuable to establish automation work back and forth. Certainly, certainly. I'm a big fan of automation. <laughs> very cool. All right. So, Jim, um, we'll, let's see what else anybody have wins that you want to share with us uh, in this holiday week. Did you guys, you know, obviously threat actors love holidays. Any Monday fun fun day for anyone out there? Seeing any nefarious stuff in your world? Or any wins in general? Not even have to be SAS alert. Oh, there's a win. <laughs> From- yeah, I, I think just getting our service team in into the loop and getting some cycles, uh, you know, for the customers that maybe don't have respond on yet, but we get a ticket now. 
um, they're, they're looking to like, you know, force a password change, you know, expire the sign-ins, things like that. It's helping them respond and catch some of these things um, as, as, they, as they come in and during, during onboarding. So um, yeah, definitely getting you know, good adoption with the teams there. The, the, so, so actually, when you say it, like on like a new customer onboarding, Stephen. Um, well, it, it's part of our like MSA updates. We'll onboard. We're on on adding uh, cloud identity, you know, our SaaS alerts kind of use. Um, so we're onboarding that service uh, for our existing customers. And so as we bring them in, um, you know, if tickets get created, uh, you know, they have a chance to manually kind of respond and then we start seeing the value of hey we've gotten you know you know the guys have manually you know locked down a few of these accounts we should go ahead and turn on the auto actions and it's a nice kind of progression i love the fact that, and i hope everybody caught up caught what you said Stephen. that as you're adding it to your msa because that yeah. is a huge huge portion of right of all of you know being covered Right from any new service that you're offering, and you know, uh, uh, sometimes a miss, right? You know, from MSPs that are adding or taking away services, but not correlating to their legal documents, um, is a huge, huge piece of this. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, Andrew, as Corey states in the chat, I see that it is, it is in fact a win. So I'm remiss in not highlighting it myself. Uh, SaaS search is now available in EMEA. Uh, we have uh, we've set it up over there in Germany um, at the behest of Solutions Granted. Uh, so they've got, you know, with SonicWall, they're expanding rapidly and, and Europe was a place that they really needed us to, to be. So uh, we've spent the last few months building that out so it's uh now up and running in uh in germany that's awesome that's awesome Corey. how's the growth and how's the sock going over abroad <laughs> uh growth well growth is slow so if you don't know much about EMEA, august is their off month a whole mm. month they just disappear mm. for a right, whole right, right. month <laughs> so now they're all coming back in september we had our holiday on monday you know the us and canadians right yay let's go us so we, we just got our first partner onboarded into there, you know, I mean, so in EMEA, I mean, it's kind of like us here in the U.S. Everyone in the U.S. wants everything in the U.S. It has to be here in the good old America, right? Well, over in EMEA, the Germans are the exact same way. Okay. Everything has to be in Germany, right? Otherwise, they don't want anything to do with it. And what typically what we found over there is, well, pretty much all of EMEA, if your data residency resides in Germany, they're fine. They're good because they have the most stringent privacy laws, et cetera. So, um, you know, that was our big push. So we have a lot of, uh, you know, SonicWall partners in general over in EMEA. A lot are coming over to our managed security services and we want to open up the, the SAS alert side to it. So, yeah, we got uh, apparently a lot of things lined up. I just have to wait on the salespeople to get them to me. Um, so but we did our first uh, onboarding into it today. Um, one thing I asked of uh, Lee Ron is, you know, the URL is going to be the same. And so something as simple as if you look in the top right of your uh, UI for SAS alerts, there's a version number. So just having a flag, you know, where, wherever the data residency is, I think would be yeah. useful, right? You know, an American flag or a German flag, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. There you go. You know where your data residency resides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he thought that was a really good idea. So that's definitely something we're doing now. Thanks, Corey. Jim. Can I make a recommendation that SAS Alerts goes all in on Oktoberfest then and maybe get a table there? <laughs> Send everybody on this call over there. Yeah. It's a, Ger it's a Germany extension organization now. I mean, come on, let's go. Yeah, yeah. If you've been to this call more than, I don't know, what, 15 times this year, then uh, you're automatically included. Uh, are you... Are you Paying the bill? Are you buying us over there? <laughs> I mean, well, so that was one qualifier. No, no, no. Third, third, third Thursday of September, will whoever has the best win of the week voted upon by their peers, they'll get the the, the expense paid trip. How's that? That's it. <laughs> like it. Awesome. All right. So we have those wins. Anyone else? 
as I scroll, scroll, scroll. Nope. Yes, holidays right. go. This one was uh, an easier one. Wait, what's that? I said as holidays go, this one was an easier one. Yeah, thank goodness. All right, Corey. Okay, Amanda, are you with us? I am, I'm here. All right, I'll stop sharing and let you share. Bear with me. Okay. Okay. And I'm just gonna talk for a few minutes and I'll share. So as everyone should know, we released parameters for Fortify a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so as with everything, you know, we release an initial version of it and then we add to it. So consistently over the next, you know, few weeks, months, years, you're going to see more and more parameters come available for more and more recommended actions. And so to bring everybody up to speed, we have a couple, they're not on production yet. They are imminent though. So they will be there, you know, shortly in the next few days. Um, and so that list is the SAS alerts fortify anti-malware policy collection, anti-phishing policy collection, anti-spam policy collection, anti-spam global outbound policy collection, anti, nope, that's it. Sorry, that was a repeat. And then we are for the turn on safe attachments. There's going to be support for a block mode and for cap recommended actions. We are going to support country locations as a new parameter. So we will be adding, like I said, new parameters to recommended actions and as well as the new parameters themselves. If a new um, data type makes sense, we will be adding that data type. So just to show everybody what I'm talking about, I'm going to go through just a couple of those items that I just mentioned. Can you guys see Fortify right now on my screen? We can. Yes. Okay. So one of the ones that I just mentioned that we will be releasing. So again, this is not on production. This is in one of our lower environments <coughs> is the SAS alerts Fortify anti-phishing policy collection. When it is available for customization, you're going to see in the customization column, this edit button. When you click the edit button, you're going to see that you can add parameters. When you click the add, you'll get the drop down. And so for the instance of this one, the anti-phishing policy, you can see you can pick a specific quarantine policy and or enable users to protect within the policy. So again, we are going to add new parameters and add new add to recommended actions the availability of parameters on a case-by-case -case basis. And so this is pulling up the policies that are available already on the tenant. So you would pick that, you know, and you have your operator equal to, in this case, you're not going to have a not equal to. The other, another one to mention was that anti-spam policy collection. So again, you'd click the edit button, you'd press the add parameters button, and for here, you can see this one shows now there's a separate parameter for this one. It's the bulk email threshold. And you can see we've added some text in here to indicate to you what it is you're doing here, right? So a higher bulk email threshold means more bulk email will be delivered. And so this is a number field and it's accordingly here. So you can type in your number and then increase and in integers from there. So that is the new subset of parameters for Fortify Actions. Does anybody have any questions? All right, that's it, Andrew, then you're on mute. Thanks, Amanda. That was great. Um, just Ben, can you, um, you know, I, I know you're asking Andy to clarify, but before that, Ben, are, the, are these things that you're, setting up and just curious you know the use cases you see and how how you use it because maybe if you could share an example or two what not you know amanda was sharing for the non-managed users they could also get a sense of you know the use cases uh for the parameters and everything yeah yeah what she's just showing like do you use that yeah. what the new, the new stuff there oh yeah we uh definitely we've we kind of found it very valuable especially for policies like the uh the one that there's a fortify control that requires you to have a FIDO for all of your administrative accounts, but it specifically says NCIS, not for break glass. And before that wasn't really a way to, to inf allow you to have that exception in that conditional and that conditional access policy, but uh, definitely a, a plus as far as manage is concerned. Yeah. We're, we're moving into the fortify piece uh, right after the uh, initial connection with all the alerts. Speaking of FIDO, did you see that thing about like five dot version dot five that uh, there's this uh, all uh, YubiKeys are uh, uh, 
compromisable. However, you have to have access, like yeah. physical access to it. You need yeah. a one thousand dollars, and you have to take it apart too. Yeah. I think. So yeah. it's if someone has stolen your UB key, uh, <laughs> I think you should consider that compromise. Not yeah, compromise <laughs> not in your control. It means though, like uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I if right. I see someone breaking apart my UB key and like doing stuff with it, I'm gonna I'm gonna have some yeah. questions. <laughs> All right. Um, go ahead with Andy's questions, Ben. Uh, so, um, Andy, do you want to clarify a little bit what you mean about the integrations with mail services? So most organizations use something in addition to Microsoft to help protect their email. And um, to get, for example, they will tag as um, problematic, right? This could be a known bad email type of thing. To have that capability come in through Respond would be one. And to be able to say, hey, you don't have these services, and these services are recommended in Fortify, to present as part of a overall enhancing of Microsoft's security oh. score. Like if they have a third party and, and Microsoft suggesting that something and so that there's a like overlap, is that kind of what you're thinking? Or that you have this in addition to Microsoft, and this makes it um, even better. Uh, yeah. Because you're now beginning to stop problematic emails from actually being delivered to the inbox, as an mm. example. Yeah, I mean, I've had situations where our inline filter, maybe proof point in this case, was uh, mm -hmm. something may get through that and the kind of, you know, zero, uh, you know, attachment policy at Microsoft uh, you know, throws it into the admin quarantine there still. So there is value where we kind of have it to make sure those are configured and you know, excited mm -hmm. about those settings in Fortify. Definitely. Yeah. That, there's always that fine line, but if you're having like Microsoft and like Proofpoint do it, like, you know, do you want your technicians looking for in two places for that missing email that is somehow in another folder? <laughs> but yeah. I'm just looking since email is 80% of the way it we is. get compromised. That is there a way to say, Hey, you don't have this service. It'd be good to have this service. This service is working well, uh, you know, that type of thing. That's something to consider, yeah. It would really be a matter of knowing exactly what that service provides, like where does Proofpoint mm -hmm. fall short and, and versus what Microsoft's suggesting. Yeah, I guess one thing that came up, I noticed that uh, I had, I just didn't realize for myself, but some of the Microsoft plans don't include uh, e, you know, Exchange Online Protection. And so it was trying to set and it was failing is how I kind of saw it. And so, yeah, that was something similar where I'm starting to, you know, ask internally, you know, should we get them on, you know, change the licensing, kind of a good driver for some of those conversations. Enrique. Just uh, mentioning or, or complimenting what you mentioned, Ben, regarding what, another third-party solution picks up that Microsoft does not. In the case of Checkpoint, Harmony, Email, Avanon, they give you those statistics live on the portal, on the weekly reports. They tell you this is what came into the inbox, this is what Microsoft delivered to the inbox, delivered to the junk mail, quarantined, and this is what we auto-released from quarantine, et cetera. So they do give you those statistics. Andrew, you're on mute. Was there a question in there, Enrique, for Ben or, or the team? Just more of a statement. Oh, sorry. Ben mentioned, based on Andy's mm -hmm. comment of using third-party solutions, Ben mentioned how to know what a third-party solution is picking up yep. that Microsoft did not. And I was just mentioning that Avanon, Checkpoint, Harmony email show you live on their portal, on their reports, what my, how Microsoft performed and how they performed and they give you that live data. I got it. That's, that's, yeah, that's really good to know. That's, uh, well, we've, we've got that question before. And like when I was onboarding somebody, it was, you know, should I be using Microsoft and this? And I said, well, it really just depends on what your third party is already taken care of and how much protection you want. It's like installing two antiviruses. It's kind of like, you know... <laughs> Good. good. All right. Any others? Any other questions before we move on? 
All right, let's go. Chip, uh, you you with me to here today? Chip, uh, lean on my Chip and and Corey comrades for a uh, lot lot of, lot in the news this week. Um, this one, I uh, we're not going to spend a ton of time on, but I did want people to be aware of this uh, new quote unquote um, way in which uh, this. Uh, this was actually in Krebs on security. So, you know, Brian Krebs writes, you know, when he writes, you you, you kind of want to listen because he's about as legit a security research as you get. Um, and I'll put the URLs in, in this, but basically, so basically what, you know, you have is um, they, the sextortion, um, um, the, these um, accusations now are using, um, using geolocation chip to say, you know, show pictures of your home or your entrance or your driveway. Like I know specific, you know, not only do I have footage of you, I know specifically where you live and I'm about to leak these pictures uh, of what you're doing or this video of what you're doing. So again, um, more so, you know, you're seeing similar tactics with QR codes and things of that nature. So it was more so just a, a public service announcement that, you know, you know, let let you know close ones know, let you know customers know, um, you know what threat actors are doing and how they're you know ratcheting up um, the 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 pressure, so to speak, the pressure um, to make things seem real, so to speak. So yeah, and, it's and, just it's just building up the 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 phishing and extortion muscles, really, if you think about it, you know, now you've got Google street view, that's going to let you drive, do a drive by shot of someone's house in Georgetown. And uh, you can just add that extra emotional tug when you're telling them that they remotely turned on the webcam while you were doing something or another, right. and away you go. So I, I guess this never ends. I actually haven't heard, had anybody reach out to me lately like for a couple of years on this, I did have a friend about five years ago was like, Hey, I got this email that said that they turned on my webcam when I was doing something and I don't know how to pay him in Bitcoin. And I was like, what? <laughs> that's, that's not the answer that I'm going to give you. Let's, let's have a talk about what's really going on here. So, and I was just chuckling to myself. Well, I guess you feel pretty guilty. Um, it's but a new campaign. I mean, I, I used to see these all the time. I used to get them all the time. And my response was always the same, send them out. My friends won't be surprised, you know, they, they, they already know who I am, right? So, um, but yeah, I mean, this is smart. This is very smart of uh, being able to leverage of just simple Google street maps, and then they're going to crop it. So it actually looks like a picture because the, the Google street maps pictures are more HD than they used to be 10 years ago, right? I mean, it looks like a legitimate picture. Um, it's funny that you brought this up because I actually, yesterday I got in a, online argument, I'll call it, with some famous Twitch streamer that was actually talking about this and his views on it and what happens and doesn't happen in the adversary world. But um, yeah, I mean, this is this is a new campaign and this is yeah. going to be a very successful campaign because I'm sure it, all of us knows at least one person that has fell for the, you know, the uh, scams where the people on the phone want you to go buy Google gift cards. I've My mother-in-law fell for one of those, right? Your computer's been hacked and they're going to connect to your machine. But I mean, this is this is going to be a big deal, right? Because yeah. more and more people, especially the elderly, right, are going to fall for something like this, and it is what it is. Yeah, Corey, particularly if they live in the villages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Think about where this goes, though. You know, the next overlay, we can all predict where this is going with with AI image generation. Um, you you'll, you'll have the house pictures of things that you were doing that there's no way you thought you were doing, but somehow there's an image of you or even a moving, moving image of you uh, included in this. I mean, this, you can get super, super targeted down to individuals if you want to go after them. And it, it's, it's not going to get any less credible. We're, well, we're chip and, and where you could think about, you know, in the high dollar extortion, certainly, you know, any, you know, executive that, you know, may have be maybe doing things he or she shouldn't be doing, right? When you start to target high net worth people, um, that so so not just you know any anybody, but Corey, to your point, uh, in the article which I did put in the chat, 
they do show that picture that that you just described of how they like really hone in on and crop and it would it looks like they were right there um so the words they use they're they're more abrasive during this round of this campaign right like they're very aggressive in the words that they use um, yes it's, it's i mean it's an attack <laughs> like literally mm -hmm. like the last one is like ah oh, i got pictures of you doing this stuff send me some money or i'm gonna release them this one's like very specific on hey if you talk to anybody these are going to immediately be released i have full access to everything on your computer i have this and this and this and this and just the tone of the whole email is very aggressive Sounds like a, my conversation with Chip last night, but <laughs> I like my conversation with my wife all the time. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> all right, so that's that one. Um, but this one uh, is is uh, really, you know, last week we talked about members. We had Mike uh, Sway. You remember that one, uh, Chip and and Corey, mm -hmm. if you're on and Jim. Um, this week we've got a new um, malware, and this is really interesting. So bear with me as I kind of walk everybody through this. So um, they are leveraging um, Google Sheets very effectively for um, exfiltration um, and a whole host of things with the malware, everything from C2, Corey, and everything. I'll show you the list of things that they can do from Google Sheets. It's pretty fascinating. But how it starts off is with a typical campaign. In this case, they're impersonating tax agencies uh, highlighted here because of us and europe right that's you know where uh, obviously we're we're talking especially with sas alerts now in germany uh, but um again chip we talked last week look at the an amount again since august 5th you know tw you know it's 20,000 emails 70,000 you know like they are moving on this attack this is you know, again, like we saw the a mass amounts of Microsoft Sway accounts being spun up last week. Um, so let me move on a little bit here so we can take a look at what they're doing. It's pretty interesting. So they, um, we always talk about, we always, but we talk about living off the land, right, Corey? What we're starting to see is last week we saw Sway uh, being the SaaS quote unquote platform that threat actors using. This week it happens to be something called Infinity Free. And so they're using Infinity Free to spin up new websites. Um, and the link, right, that you click is, is, is bringing you to this new, quote unquote, you know, legitimate website that's been spun up for this tax authority. Um, um, and um, it, uh, it talks about, you know, the, the technology it's using, Google AMP, um, cache URLs, et cetera. So then... Um, this is really cool. Uh, this is where I might need chip your technology head, if you would. So there's this, um, this, uh, um, uh, where is it here? This windows protocol, um, that is being employed. And what, what it does is if you take a look at this, it looks as if it's local. Correct. And when you look at that, wouldn't you say that's local resident on your machine? You would think. You would think, but it's actually it's not. They're using I mean, a little, the little shortcut icon on there is kind of a giveaway. It, you know, it's a pointer, but yeah. a lot of people aren't going to notice that. Yes, correct. And most correct. people think uh, point. You know, there's only point somewhere local. Yeah, great point, Stephen. So, so they're using this protocol from windows to make it seem as if, oh, well this, you know, you know, it's, it's on my machine. So again, more legitimate than it would be, you know, on some website, I'm not going to open necessarily something on a website, but, oh, here's this, you know, document, this tax form, whatever on my website. I, I mean, a local to me. So, um, so, the, so, so the, the way, the way in which they're bringing this all together is, is pretty fascinating. And then the 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 malware, um, in essence, Corey takes over this the Google Sheet, and here's all the commands that the Google Sheet can actually do. Um, once once uh, once the um, threat actor has 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 taken over 
uh, which is, I thought, again, pretty fascinating use of, you know, again, all these tools that we, you know, again, typically wouldn't question almost like, you know, the way threat actor takes, you know, uses something legitimate on our, you know, on our network that we would normally use, we wouldn't question. So um, it seems they're taking the same, the analogistic living off the land, but taking it to the SaaS world. Does that, am I seeing that correctly from your eyes as well? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I find it particularly interesting that they're using Samba and WebDAV as protocols um, to, you know, to host and attach to the malware. Mm -hmm. uh, I was left out of out of your out of the previous example here, the sextortion, Andy. But I've received no less than a half dozen um, of these PDF attachment emails, which you know they come in. The very very first one I saw said. Uh, Q3 financial, fiscal Q3 financial re results. And it was from someone that I didn't know. So of course I immediately emailed our compliance officer and said, are you up to phishing campaigns again? And he said, no. <laughs> um, but that was the first one I saw and I've seen a half dozen since. And oddly enough, um, you guys, I think most of you know, we're a Google Workspace shop. Um, I found Google Workspace Gmail enterprise to be very, very good at flagging spam, um, you know, phishing, any kind of malware. And all of them have gotten through. Um, all, well, I, I shouldn't say all of them have gotten through because I've gone and haven't checked what hasn't gotten through. But the fact that a half dozen in a week have gotten through is is an interesting shift for do me. You, do you think it could be related to this campaign ship? Oh, it definitely is. It's the exact, it's the exact same kind of stuff. It's it's all it's all PDFs that are coming through. They're all, you know, the, the icon attached with the attachment is all PDF. Um, and of course, I'm not clicking about on it. I'm not particularly worried about it because I'm a Mac user and I'm not a, you know, Windows user, but Macs are not immune. So I don't, I don't click on any attachment unless I'm literally expecting it. I mean, could they take this a step further for, from a spear, you know, which could get real, real, quote unquote, is if it's spear phishing chip and it is, hey, it's from Jim. Jim, hey, Chip, can you take a look at these? financials if if and you know then it then i think it could get a lot of teeth couldn't it yeah uh, i mean if it if it came from from jim's corporate or personal you know um email account it sure would um if you know and that's always a risk if someone's this is another way of living off the land you compromise and attack successfully now you're right back into being able to use these kinds of tools um and methods to go from one compromised organization to another because what a, what are they what does an attacker do once they're in? They're going to sit there and look at the conversations, figure out the important relationships. And then this is just another tool they can use to go ahead and perpetuate further infection. Yeah. I'm, su I'm surprised that they haven't, or maybe they will, Chip. Th this would be, you know, to me, a very easy one to turn into instead of a tax authority. Oh, it's from your supplier is you know, you know, is, you know, let, let's just say, you know, they know, you know, you're looking at relationships of, hey, your AWS supplier, you know, bill is, you know, or your Google bill has been uh, recalculated. Because well, I think they have, Andrew, I mean, not that specific example. But again, I've seen this same, um, this same set of tools landing in my inbox. Um, you know, none of them have been from a tax authority. They've been from several different, there's several different pretty well-crafted emails that look like there's an attachment there that I would, you know, a lot of people would just reflexively click on that attachment after reading some that, something that's reasonably well-composed, might catch their interests. And there's been a bunch of different topics that I've seen these come through. I, I don't think it's limited just to this, you know, th this is an example of a broader campaign that's being put to use by a specific tool set it's not just one thing it's the tool set that's the that's the that's the topic yeah fair okay um any questions comments on this yeah i'm, I'm on the proof point side reading through the whole story on it i mean what obviously what for, you know looking at it from a defense standpoint uh once they initiate the link file powershell is heavily invo is invoked and used during this which then downloads a uh, Python executable as well. So, I mean, that's, you know, looking at it in layers, 
this is where the benefit of having a, a good endpoint solution as well to that can and some, someone that's monitoring PowerShell usage for something like this, you know, PowerShell being used to download files, example. Um, is that something that Defender, you know, integration would service if there was, you know, if that was running? Um, I wasn't sure if that, you know, that events come into SAS alerts at all. Um, I wish I could answer that, but I don't have, I've never used the Defender ATP version. So an EDR would have to be the one detecting this. Yeah, it's your definitely. EV, yeah, your EDR. AV wouldn't be doing it. Yeah, right. so that's Steven, where I'd be looking, question, yeah. Yes, if, if Defender is attached in Sazzler to the Defender endpoint piece um, and it picks up this activity, then it, that that event would appear in Sazzler's. Yeah, I'm seeing some customers going for our EDR, which might be Sentinel One, but others have different licensing. Some of that includes Defender for Endpoint. Um, so something to consider. Yeah. Corey, with this piece here, that this it's still invoking PowerShell to do this. Um, you know, because it because it was when I was reading it, maybe I was reading a different article, maybe you know, a different article of the same thing. It, it appeared that they were utilizing this protocol to make it appear local. Um, but you're, are, are you suggesting this is the same thing? Am I, am I hearing you correctly? Where they're correct? Working? I mean, well, the, with the HTML attachments, right, which then brings it local to the machine. There's still Power PowerShell heavily involved in this whole process. Okay. And the, I mean, again, the problem is not a lot of people monitor PowerShell because it's so noisy and there's so much mm -hmm. going on and. If you're not configured, you're not watching, and you can't pull this needle out of the haystack, it's tough. Got it. I mean, I'm, I'm still surprised they're using an attachment in general. You know, one of the biggest head scratcher for me from a defense standpoint, you know, solid phishing campaign was using a link to a OneDrive. Not OneDrive, I'm sorry, OneNote. Right. And your email security is not going to convict that link to a OneNote. Right, because it goes to a legit Microsoft IP. It can't scan what's happening in that OneNote. Inside that OneNote is like a, you know, PDF look, right? That has another link that will actually have you download something malicious. It takes your email security off the out of play here. That hmm. to me, that was the most successful phishing campaign that so far I've seen because they took attachments out of it. Because email security is getting better, right? You know, link analysis, attachment analysis, and so. I feel like some solutions should be able to identify if you're if you legitimately have an HTMI, or sorry, HTML attachment included in this email. You mean this thing? Yeah, sounds like something to, fun to play with. Yeah, well, I'll send one over to you. There you go. <laughs> I'll give you all my accounts <laughs> with a live payload. And make sure you put in there that you have pictures of me doing weird things and you're going to send them out to everybody. Too. <laughs> you're, 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 you're driving. We had a customer. <laughs> What's that, Steve? Uh, sorry, we had a customer release. They were testing some of the filtering and solutions and security and they had released something that had gotten quarantined, but it was, yeah, it was like an HTML attachment and it did pretty much a login um, attempt um, like, like that. But being local kind of skirted like the web filtering and stuff that would typically sort of catch it. So yeah, it's a, another one of those avenues. Yeah. Um, oh, and th this is um, just a, a, a few more things here, Chip, for you and Corey to see. Um, they're actually <laughs> utilizing Google's API. Um, there's a whole, you know, I didn't, you know, post the whole, piece here of how it exfills this is the whole exfil piece of, of how it uses google sheets um to once once that um you click on that uh pdf you're in you know the malware is deployed mm -hmm. and then they start exfilling with this uh command here uh and pulling everything into google sheets so use it using google's api So interesting stuff. Yeah, that's gonna take a little more digging on our side. I want to see what they're doing with that. Okay, I'll make sure I send you over the the link. 
Yeah. Um, I have a few more things. This is, you know, we did, uh, remember we did last week, um, some of the smishing stuff, um, trying to remember the two we talked about last week, but this is, you know, just the latest one that is, is out there as well from the U um, USPS this time to be aware of. Um, again, you know, have a wonderful day. Enjoy the sunshine. Certainly isn't something the USPS is probably going to say, but uh, needless to say, this is one that has um, garnered some attention, these U USPS notifications, which I think we're all you know up to speed with, but I just wanted to, to share this one happens to be out there and some proliferation. Always, always a good reminder for all of us to tell everyone we know. Yeah. I get a couple of these a week, the USPS ones. They crack me up. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and then... Um, this is where I wanted to kind of leave us off. This is going to be the cyber call topic this week. Corey, have you seen this? This is yeah. pretty fascinating. Let me, um, I'm going to just give you guys the high level, then I'll link out to the article and show you guys. But this is the topic of the cyber call this week. This is pretty, I think, kind of alarming, to be honest. So here's the situation. City of Columbus um, has a su successful cyber attack by a fairly, you know, um, you know, a, le a very legitimate threat actor. Um, there's, as you can see here, this is from the dark web, right? They're, they're like, Hey, we have 6.5 terabytes of data, um, available, um, you know, and all of this, you know, you know, legitimate stuff that we have. The city comes out and says, nothing to worry about here. Um, A, it's old data. B, um, the way in which it's encrypted, it can't be um, seen, right? So it's corrupt, it's corrupt, it's encrypted. And, and, and so this is the stance of the city. So far, you guys with me? Yeah, so far I'm cracking up at the city. Whoever, right. whoever their PR person is on their cyber response team needs to start looking for a job. So the city, um, so so this researcher goes out to the dark web and finds, you know, the the data being offered, and you know how they typically they'll they'll give you allow you to see a sample, right? Sample set of before you buy the data. Hey, well you can you can see it, and sure enough, the researcher looks at it and goes, "This isn't like." A, I can see it. B, I see social security numbers, active police cases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he, so he starts reaching out to the city saying, hey, what you're telling everybody is incorrect. You know, I'm trying to, so I'm trying to be a good person here as a researcher and coming to the city saying, you know, you know, I'm, I'm trying to help you guys. The city ignores him. And keep and kind of doubles down on their stance. Um, so he goes to the media and shows the media, hey, I've got concerns for the city of Columbus because there's real information here that is accessible to anybody on the dark web um, that wants to go buy this. City, so the media breaks the story, and lo and behold, he is sued and has a gag order on him now by the city of Columbus. So, um, so le le let me stop sharing. Um, and um, let me just see if I can show you guys real quick here the uh, actual article. If you both g give me one moment, um, because because I think this is, um, I, I, first off, while I'm finding it, Chip, what are your thoughts? Um, you know, because to me, this is, it, it, I, I think there's a bigger thing. It, what I, you know, I was talking to Eric Tilds, Tilds about this, of, you know, is there a precedent? He goes, no, it's, it's, it's you know, it's a city, right? And, and so he goes, I don't think a precedent's going to be set. Every every city and, you know, this, you know jurisdiction has their, you know, their, their own rights to do whatever they want. But, um. Uh, it, it is interesting to what degree, you know, as a, as a security researcher now to, to be a white hat, are you trying to do good stuff? Are you going to be potentially on the hot seat for, 
Um, so what, what are your thoughts so far? Well, first off, can you bring that image back up? Uh, which one, Chip? The last one we were just looking at that said City of Columbus and then uh, a screenshot of what looked like a data upload. How, do you want me to actually bring, I have two articles on it. Do you want, is that okay too? Uh, sure, if you can find the same image, because I actually have a question about the image, because it looks, oh, okay. if the I mean, image was actually related to what this White Hat researcher um, discovered, or maybe where he discovered it, you know, it, it looks like that the original hackers put all this data out for an auction trying to get somebody to buy it. They, they, didn't, they did. No one bought it. So the guy just, so they just hung it out on the dark web for anybody to find. So... So and that and I'm bringing it up because it changes the conversation around the question you're asking, which is, you know, there's one thing for bug bounty hunters out there that are that are, um, you know, that are going rodeo and just doing it on their own, finding stuff, taking it to companies and saying, hey, we'd like you to pay us a bounty on this, even though you don't have a formal bug bounty program, we just want you to pay us. And that's borderline extortion. Right. Um, but in this instance that you're talking about. You know, this guy stumbles across this data in, in the dark web that's already been completely publicly made available. Okay. So for him to turn it around and take it to the press, I mean, it, it it's already public, I guess, is the point I'm making. And and and, and, and that's that's why, um, for example, uh, this is it. Yeah, this is the actual. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the image. Yeah. So and that's the or the argument, you know, that, you know, Bob Miller is the one um, from uh, Global Data that, you know, kind of find saw this first. He's like. You know, the city, you know, it, he feels this is a lot of ignorance on the city. The city's like, you know, yeah. you have some, you know, magic ways in which you're you're finding, you know, you know, data that's not accessible and you're, you know, doing nefarious things yourself, Mr. Security Researcher. And and I think it's a lot of ignorance, Chip, to um, you know, th 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 to your point, this is it. Th th it's exposed. It's right. available. Uh, look. I, I don't want, I won't be too snarky, I hope, but how do you expect city governments are going to react? I mean, our federal government reacts like this when they get caught with their pants down. So you, I wouldn't expect a massively different reaction. I mean, that's a generalization. There's probably some, there may be a little borough somewhere in Ohio with of 650 people who has a couple of smart guys that live there and said, hey, you know, you shouldn't be mad at this guy. He brought it to our attention. He got it. Fair and square, air fingers quotes. It was out there in the public domain anyway, so we shouldn't be suing him. Right. I mean, if the city goes after this guy, they are. I think he, in the end, I think he'll have a he'll have a legal action against the city. Um, you know, for at the very least, maligning him, if not, you know, um, a false prosecution, and if he's been arrested, I don't know, probably not. Um, although he should be, if they think it's a criminal activity, then there should be an arrest made. So I just think they're way overstepping their bounds. You know, this isn't the hacker. He didn't pay somebody to get the data. It's in the public domain anyway. He took it to them, did nothing about it. And his next moral obligation is to the public, really, to the citizens of, of Columbus. So he says, hey, I'm going to go to the press with it. We'll let the press handle it and they can notify the people of Columbus. I mean, I don't know, Corey, I see you nodding. I don't, I don't know if you if you concur across the board, but I'm I'm not seeing I'm seeing the city being really, really stupid here. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's par for the course. It's not just governments, local, federal. I see MSP is doing it when we report breaches, compromises, right? Where it's it's not as bad as, you know, it's not that bad. We're good. Not that bad. We're just going to pull the endpoint and re-image, right? Um, a, a lot of organizations kind of try to take a big incident and, Bring it down so everybody feels more comfortable with themselves. I think the big issue behind the story, city of Columbus is going to get annihilated after this if they really go after this guy. Yeah. You know, think, think about the days of when Anonymous was really out there and on their their high, you know, on the high high points of Anonymous and something like this would kind of re-bring them back up to really, you know, groups targeting Columbus just because of just you know principle behind what they're doing. Yeah. Bob, I see your hand up We're coming right to you. Just yeah. from a legal perspective, um, Chip and Corey, like again, talking to uh, Eric Tilt, he, he doesn't think the city has a leg like, to stand on. Uh, he doesn't think they'll win at all. Um, but uh, Bob, you go ahead, please. 
just a couple things come to mind that my daughter brought to my attention. She's a coder in uh, Vancouver. Um, so one is supposedly there was a case in the States where a judge ruled that hitting F12 and, you know, seeing the code underneath um, was a enough of a violation, like from a, from the judge's point of view that they were trying to hack and they, um, because someone was suing them and they said, well, yeah, you're hacking because you hit F12. Had you had, I don't know if you'd heard that, but um, I don't know if it was precedent setting or what it was, but it was definitely a case in the state, states where that happened. And then the second thing that happened with the, my daughter was she was um, uh, on a on a website looking for some information, not so much information, but certain information about her. It was a, it was a database of information and she went in to the kind of the back door, the, not the back door, but just the F12 and could see a whole bunch of people's names, addresses, social insurance numbers. Nothing was covered, right? All the privacy thing was all broken. It was just really badly, really badly done. And so what we advised her to do was to not go directly back to the company because she could be charged as a hacker um, going back in that way. They could say, well, you're hacking and you're trying to get in this back door. So what she did, and I, and I can't remember the name, nor said there's, a na there's an organization in the States that you can notify of this kind of stuff. And then they'll go to the companies and say, hey, did you know that you have this large hole on your data and you should fix it? And then they take over. And it gets into a whole bunch of privacy laws and things like that. And hopefully I'm explaining it well. If you need more information, I can get it for you. But those are the two things that came to mind when I saw that. And I'm just wondering if you had heard of those things. I personally haven't, but Chip. Yeah, I, I have not. I mean, every developer that works with web applications that I know of and lots of people who don't understand that, you know, behind what is depicted on a, in your web browser on a web page is a whole lot of information. Um, it's rarely actually code, by the way, but it's information about what's going on between the page um, and the server in order to render the page. And when somebody doesn't take security precautions and doesn't do anything to render um, data that should be um, encrypted, in in that page, then it then it's out there naked for anyone to see. You know, your your daughter Bob didn't write and execute um, some kind of a script to attack the browser and extract data. She used a a, a, a common function in Windows. Uh, Mac users don't have that same F twelve, but there we have a different way of going about getting to what we call the inspector, so that you can look at the code behind a page. And it's not her fault. My God, that. The page is is constructed poorly, and that there's no security, and all the data is in clear text. You know that's which I, yeah, which I totally agree with you. But we just didn't want to take the risk, um, from her perspective, right? To say, oh, what well, this is it, and you're trying to hack us, yeah, because they could they could make that argument, and that's why I brought the whole thing up about the first thing on the judge, which is why I can't remember the name of the organization. I'll get it for you guys and send it to you. But there's a certain organization in the states that you could report this to. Because they're breaking all sorts of privacy laws um, and PIPAs and all the things that go with it. And basically, we're saying, you know, we're trying to go fix your code, right? That's what we're trying to say. And But we're going to, it's a larger organization that does this. And then if they get sued um, by this organization, well, they have tons of lawyers to deal with it. Yeah. I, I'd be interested in, in if you can find it. You said you're in, she's in Seattle? Vancouver, Vancouver. So Washington, I mean, uh, of all the states, can, can, Vancouver, Canada, Oh, okay. Canada. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah. I, even still, I, I, it's just would surprise me that there's, I, mean, I Canada is, I guess, different. I don't know why they would have such, you know, some such law that would try and restrict people from looking at the, you know, the underlying HTML and network traffic and console traffic that goes on in a browser. That seems crazy to me. It, it's that that would be government and and the law being extremely ignorant of how technology works. So I sure wouldn't expect to see that. But um, I'd be I'd be keen if you could find 
any uh, links to that particular, um, you know, legal construct that 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 they're applying yeah. in uh, in Vancouver, that would be pretty interesting. What, can you say your email, or is that a? Oh no, that everybody knows that. It's just chip at sasalerts dot com. Chip at Sassler. I didn't know if it was chipped up Bach or C Bach or whatever. That but... would work too. Okay. Got a Google okay. sheet coming your way, Chip. Um, <laughs> So, so, but this is in closing it out, it's, it's, it's your point, Chip. You, you kind of hit on it. It's like, you know, there, the, it, it seems like it just, you know, we, even though the, we, the city, got caught with our pants down and a, and a huge data exfil, we're going to call this guy that went to the dark web now a criminal. That That's what they're trying to turn this. It's like the almost like a classic narcissistic move. Yeah, I mean, look, and all of us are going, this is a don't shoot the messenger scenario, right? Right. You know, but I guess that happens all the time. You get embarrassed and you get pissed off at the person that that called out um, your embarrassment. And look. And meanwhile, they was trying to help him, Chip. Yeah. He was literally trying it. to help. I they, totally get it. We're going to ignore you. We're going to ignore you. You know, it's, it's such a classic, you know, and now we're going to try to prosecute you. Yes. And I, I agree with Corey. They're, Columbus, Columbus is going to get blasted up one side and down the other, not only from the legal side, from on from this guy coming back as a plaintiff. But as Corey says, you know, the the actual hacking community out there, I would expect him to come all over him. Yeah, I agree. This is civil, not criminal, right? So far, um, they, they well, so far there's a... Yeah, it's like it looks like it's civil so far, Corey. But as I said, I don't get that either. That that tells me there's even more ignorance of the law. I don't. I'm not aware of civil statutes for hacking. They're they're all criminal. Yeah, because it's it's a fine chip. It's like we're fining you twenty five thousand dollars. Yep. So I think they have it all. I think it's going to be a big mess for them. Andrew, I think you should book this guy as a guest on either this call or uh, your cyber call. Yeah, once he's available, I would love to. I, I'm sure he won't talk much right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but all right. Awesome. Everybody have a fantastic week and uh, we look forward to seeing you next Thursday. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Bye, guys. Bye.